Hi there everyone, it's Russell, welcome to the Reading Fabricator, and today I'm going to talk about yet another brilliant Japanese novel, published in the 1960s, uh, possibly Shusaku Endo's most popular novel, most well-known novel, most uh, critically acclaimed novel, it is Silence. This one here contains an introduction by Mart Martin Scorsese, who adapted it into a feature-length film about six years ago. Unfortunately, it didn't do well at the box office, but I actually quite liked it. I only just recently watched it and thought it was quite a brilliant adaptation of the, of the book. Now, I've actually had this novel sitting on my shelf for, yeah, since 2016, so about six or seven years. And I've got, I've uh, had two false starts before with it. Uh, the first time I got about 100 pages in, the second time I got about, I don't know, 40 pages in. I just kept putting it, putting it off. I don't, I don't know why that is. It happens with quite a lot of books as well. But having sort of gotten back into a sort of a Japanese reading marathon, uh, I just pre I just read uh, The Woman in the Dunes, which was quite a brilliant piece of existentialist literature as well. This is the complete opposite. This has nothing to do with that. This is um, entirely a religious experience, although you don't have to have any beliefs in order to fully appreciate the emotion that is in this book. Um, I, I'm in no way affiliated with any religion, but I found this to be quite a, an emotional, taxing, somewhat traumatizing read. And I highly recommend anyone out there who loves literature, particularly Japanese literature and even historical fiction of sorts, to seek this one out. It is, it is a very damn good read indeed. The tale of two Portuguese priests. We've got Father Rodriguez and another one. Uh, now in the movie it's pronounced Father Garupe, but in the in the book uh, his name is spelled G-A-R-R-P-E. So I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it, if it's pronounced Garp or I don't know. So I'm just going to refer to him as Father Garupe for the actual ongoing of this text. Uh, but they travel to Japan uh, during heavy turmoil, during a very turbulent time in Japanese his history. This is during the 17th century, around mid, mid uh, early to mid 1640s, uh, where there's a persecution going on, where Japanese are trying to eradicate Christianity and its beliefs from the country. And the persecution that goes on, which I, from what I can tell actually really did happen, uh, especially some of these torture techniques that they use, uh, and it's described in in a minimalist way, but also in quite uh, a taxing way as well. And by that, I mean it's it's quite hard to read. Um, you, you get quite a few torture techniques that are described here in this book uh, from the main characters who witness it and from and who hear about it. And whilst they're going to Japan to re-establish Christianity, help Christians in hiding, perform baptisms and mass, go to various villages to uh, proceed with that. Um, and help the missionaries that are also being persecuted. They, they, they bear witness to a lot of these tragedies. Uh, some of the um, techniques include um, uh, people being put on the cross, being put out just, just inside the ocean, and then they wait till the tide rises and the tide comes up to their chin and the waves just keep smashing them over and over again. And sometimes it'll, they'll be like that for days until eventually they'll just die of physical and mental exhaustion. So there's that way as well. Uh, another one is where they're hanging upside down over a pit where they put a cut behind the ear or somewhere on the head, hang them upside down and the blood is dripping down. Well, and um, that's a really, really awful bit that's described in the book where Father Rodriguez complains to someone to tell that person to stop snoring and they respond, no, 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 that's, that's, that's no one snoring. Those are people that are moaning being hung, out, hung in the pit. Uh, and that really, that wasn't a real eye-opener scene. It's, um, it's quite brutal indeed. Um, another one is where they're taken to the hot springs, tied to a post, and the tormentors put put water from the hot springs in these ladles with holes in the bottom and drip it all over the um, prisoners. And with the holes in the bottom, it prolongs the torture experience, makes the pain more excruciating. Uh, so that that's just gives you an idea of what was going on during this time in Japan. Absolute, absolute turmoil, absolute turbulence. It was, it was quite a horrific time indeed. But if... If they do renounce their religion, they have to do so in a specific way. By that, I mean the um, the people that are sent by the uh, Inquisitor. I think his, uh, his name is Ino Inoue. Uh, he's the lead Inquisitor who sends the people out to seek out these Christians and missionaries and put them to justice. He will rally up an entire village, find the ones that he claims to be of, of Christianity, and they'll take out this thing called a fumi, which is a wooden plaque card of either the Virgin and Child or of Jesus Christ or of some sort of um, religious iconography that is related to Christianity. Place it on the ground and all you have to do is trample over it so, and sometimes they even get them to spit on the cross as well and provided you do that they'll let you go and um, yeah the ones that don't uh, submit it to those torture techniques until they either admit that they're Christian or uh, 
just renounced religion in its entirety. So whilst these two Portuguese fathers uh, travel all the way to Japan, in order to do so, they have to stop off in Macau and find a Japanese fisherman who will smuggle them into Japan. Obviously, they just can't go straight to Japan or they'll get uh, trialed, uh, they'll get imprisoned. So they find what is, who, who they consider to be the only, the only Japanese man in Macau, this man by the name of Kichijiro, who has previously renounced religion, has trampled on the, on the Fumi and all that sort of thing. Uh, they don't find out until a little bit later. But it's quite obvious that at the time he had he wanted nothing to do with the religion and he's sort of homesick. He's lying in drunk, just trying to get back to Japan. He agrees to take them back after finding out they are priests. And they get into Japan, they smuggle they smuggle their way into Japan, and whilst they're also going there to re-establish Christianity and to help the Christians there, there, there's also a second mission behind this all. They want to try and track down what happened to Father Ferreira, who has been there for 20 years, has sort of built up a reputation for himself as being just an absolutely brilliant person. And from a letter that they received, it is gathered that he has renounced religion and is living under a Japanese name with a Japanese family in Nagasaki. And he's considered somewhat of a mentor to them as well. And the way he's talked about throughout this book, leading up to the moment where you actually meet him, it reminded me a lot of Colonel Kurtz from Heart of Darkness, actually, and he, he, even the um, adaptation for Apocalypse Now. It's just you, you, you learn little bits about this man all the way through, and then once you get to the big meeting, it's sort of like you're, you're starstruck. You want to know, you're just glued to the page. You want to know everything about this man. And he's a very fascinating figure indeed. He's very tall, black-haired. He just towers over all the Japanese people. And uh, the, the encounter that he has with Father Rodriguez is quite uh, a menacing in one indeed. Uh, so for those who uh, have read the book or watched the movie, you will obviously know what I'm talking about when I go through with this. But let me just make things clear. I will be giving out some spoilers. So if, you're, if you prefer not to hear them until you've read the book or even seen the movie, by all means, stop and just come back to it later. But in order, in order for me to give you a full appreciation of my love for this book, I have to go into these territories, unfortunately. So uh, here's your warning, pretty much. <laughs> so when the two fathers arrive in this Japanese village, they establish they establish mass, and um, pretty soon, various people, various villages from all around, just start congregating. And eventually, the amount of people that they have to give conf hear confessions for, and perform baptisms, and perform mass, just keeps on expanding keeps on expanding to the point where they actually have to start traveling to different villages to just continue on with their mission. And this is where the two fathers sort of separate and go on their own separate, go on their own separate uh, missions. And yes, on top of that, uh, Rodriguez is asking around about Father Ferreira, who, um, as he believes it, has apostatized, has trampled on the Fumi. Now, what I haven't mentioned here is that about two-fifths of the book, so about 100 pages out of the 250 pages, is written in letters or journal entries from Father, F Father Rodriguez. Uh, I think it's to Father Valinaya, and it's 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 a very minimalist description. He, he he talks about everything in a very minimalist way, but it's also expanded enough that you're able to get a, a clear picture of what you're reading about of the Japanese landscape and of all the things that they do and where they're hiding. They have to hide in a hut up in the hills uh, during the daytime before they come out at night to perform their um, mass and all that sort of thing. And so it's it's sort of like cut up into bits and pieces. You don't get the full picture, but you get more than enough for you to get a clear mind of what's going on. What, what ends up happening, and this is the brilliant part of the book, I think, this is, this is where it flips, everything flips, is that once you get to around page 100, this is where the spoiler alert comes in, uh, he, he finds out that he's Kichijiro dobbed him in in order to get some silver. Uh, what ends up happening is the Inquisitor has offered people 100 pieces of silver to uh, inform on a Christian, 200 pieces of silver to turn in a Christian, and 300 pieces of silver to turn in a priest. So that's what he's done. So they take, they track down Rodriguez and uh, take him in. And the rest of the book is about his imprisonment in these various Japanese places in these cells. And it's through it's from that point onwards where the book switches as it switches writing style to in a, in a way to service the plot and to service you as the reader. It goes from journals and letters into a more traditional third-person narrative it, at the exact moment that he is captured um, to help help move the plot forward, which I thought was absolutely brilliant. What a brilliant way to not only re-engage yourself into the story, but to just mix things up a little bit, just to keep you like, when, when I got to that certain section there, that, that, that opening chapter, I read the first paragraph and thought, what the hell is going on here? Why isn't it written in this sort of style? 
but then you get used to it. And I, just, I really appreciate why the author did it in that way there. It's really good. Um, I thought that was a genius, genius writing technique there. So not only does the plot change course, but it also flips the writing on you, brings you back into the story a little bit. And from this point onwards, the uh, descriptions expand. You get a wider canvas of what's going on. Um, and th and in, in characters are introduced as well. Um, this is where you also meet the Inquisitor and you meet probably the most interesting character in the book, which is the Interpreter. Uh, at one point, the Interpreter introduces himself by coming to Rodriguez's cell. And they begin having a bit of a debate about Christianity versus Buddhism. Buddhism being a particularly strong religion in um, Japan at the time and probably still is for all, I don't know. You have that conversation there. The second conversation is with the Inquisitor, which I thought was quite interesting indeed. But it's the third conversation where he finally goes and meets Father Ferreira, where it turns out, yes, he has apostatized. He has taken an, under a Japanese name of someone that has died. He has taken in a Japanese family and kids, and he lives in Nagasaki. And the way it's described of him coming from the distance alongside these samurai and the interpreter towards Rodriguez, the way he, he's described just coming towards him, this, this tall figure, this, this person that Rodriguez looked up to as an absolute mentor, as a brilliant priest. And then to have this conversation where the, the, the image that keeps coming back to my mind is when they're talking about how Japan is a swamp and that Christianity is a seed that gets put in the swamp and the roots are failing to take hold. That, gets, that, gets, that comes back over and over again in this conversation here. It is remarkable writing, remarkable dialogue. And the thematics of it all just really bring it home for me. It's a real home run, this stretch of the book. Especially, I'd say the last 50 pages are a real home run in particular. So when, so when it comes to the actual writing style, I mean, I was sold straight away. And, and, and I can tell why some people are a bit hesitant to read this book, given how it is a pretty religious book. But in all honesty, believe me when I say, when I say this, you don't have to have a belief system in order to appreciate this book. Um, I don't, and I thought this was a brilliant read. Um, I thought it was emotional at times, particularly in the latter half of the book where he starts questioning his own religion while in, in imprisonment. And there's a very, probably the best part of the book was where he is confronted with the Fumi and he he just is trying not to step on, not to trample on it, but it's just fighting hard against him. And just the various things that happen to him while he's in this imprisonment in that latter half of the book. Uh, you can you can see that it's really taking a toll on him and obviously the torture techniques that are happening throughout the book are quite uh, challenging indeed but when you fight through all that you get a, an emotionally rewarding experience and um, it leads to what I consider to be um, one probably the greatest conversation in the book which involves Kichijiro. Now Kichijiro he's the character that shows up throughout the entire book. You meet him at the start of the book and he keeps on showing up all the way through. He's, he's basically following Rodriguez wherever he goes, and he keeps on saying that I, I have sinned, I must seek confession. And, I mean, even before his imprisonment, Rodriguez was basically just telling him, but, well, not really telling him, but thinking that he cannot trust this man. There is something about him that is off. And you as a reader perceive that as well. Even you think, what is going on with this guy? Why is he acting this way? And obviously things come, things come to light. And as I said before, I've given enough spoilers in this video, but um, I honestly do think that even with all the spoilers I've given you, uh, that doesn't even begin to scratch the surface of this book. You could still read it and find it a, a, a rewarding experience on your own front. Uh, what I've talked about barely scratches the surface. But the, but the final conversation between Rodriguez and um, Kichijiro, which takes place in what is, what is a coda. So it starts off with the journal entries and the letters, moves into the third person narrative. And then you have a coda, which are extracts from the diary of Johansson, Jonasson, a clerk at the Dutch firm, Dejima Nagasaki. Uh, and through his uh, journal entries, which, um, yeah, as I said before, serve as a coda, you find out a little bit more about what happened to Ferreira and Rodriguez leading up to the end. And, yeah, as I said before, um, it, it leads to a final sort of conversation slash confrontation between Kichijiro and Rodriguez. It's a small one. It's about three or four pages long. But that conversation there goes down as one of the biggest, one of the greatest reading experiences I've encountered in a long time. It is powerful stuff indeed, and this is a powerful book. I can see why so many people are enamored with it. I can see why it's considered one of the greatest Japanese novels of all time. It makes me want to read more work by Shisaku Endo. And yeah, it, this has been, this and The Woman in the Dunes have been tremendous reads for me. It's really opened my eyes 
uh, and taking me away from other authors such as uh, the more popular ones like Murakami and uh, makes me want to go back and read some more Yuko Mishima. Um, I have read, uh, I think I have read The Sailor Who Fell From Ghost of the Sea, but it's been so long I don't remember any of it, so I should probably go back and read it. Uh, I've also got Confessions of a Mask and one of his first in the Tetralogy, I think, uh, Spring Snow. So uh, I'm, I'm really falling for Japanese literature at the moment. Truly am head over heels for it. This, this has been an absolutely rewarding book. I'm glad I read it and I think you should read it too. Five stars for me. It's, it's brilliant. Thanks very much and uh, see you on the next one. Bye.